yeah, we're going to turn it around ASAP and, and they're right to look at me. But, but what I would say is, is keep believing in the players. We've got a great set of players. We've got some good quality players. It will turn. The tide will turn. We've been, we have been down this route before and, and it's got to turn quick. Inter Miami introduced new faces and delivered a better performance. But in the end, this past weekend, finished with an all too familiar Hello and hola to everyone y todos. Welcome back to the number one weekly and bilingual Inter Miami focused podcast, providing you with all the latest team news, analysis, opinions, inside information, general punditry, and much more. My name is Franco Panizo, and I am one of the weekly co hosts of this show, which has been listened to in more than 50 countries and where the beautiful game collides with deep passion and analysis. This is the first of what will be two episodes this week. Yes, that's right. You will be hearing two different Miami Total Football radio shows and two different Miami Total Football radios over the course of the next few days as Inter Miami continues its busy three games in eight days stretch. And joining me for this first episode of the week is none other than then one of our usual co-hosts and the person who may have gotten the shortest response from Phil Neville in a press conference, if not this season, then maybe during Phil Neville's entire time as Inter Miami head coach. I am, of course, talking about Jose Armando. Jose, how are you doing today? Uh, I don't know how I'm doing. I think I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I, I just, I just, I just can't wait, man. I just can't wait. When you know, for us, it's a lot of fun when there's three games, and um, I know it stands for some of the fans and and players and coaches involved right now in Inter Miami. Ah, uh, man, but it's so much fun to do this job. It is so much fun to have uh, the opportunity to watch soccer for a living, and just three games in a week should be a lot of fun. So I just can't wait. It's it's the perfect way to start recording the pod. So let's let's get to it. You sound very optimistic uh, and very positive, despite the overall mood surrounding Inter Miami right now. Well, last time we spoke, what? last time we spoke, you were you know you were like not frustrated, but you said you were you know bothered by the fact the team couldn't win for the fans. Now. You sound much more I just positive. Have, Why? I have accepted reality, and now I'm enjoying the game. Now I'm I'm enjoying going out there doing my job. So uh, I just have accepted reality, and I guess you know it's it's on the team to to save the season if they want to. Reality is harsh for Inter Miami because it's another defeat, a record tying franchise record tying sixth straight defeat after losing this past weekend to the Houston Dynamo. We will dive into that game. We will break it all down. Talk about some of the individual performances. Talk about one player that was benched and what it all means. And of course, we will preview the upcoming Miami Classico, which takes place on Wednesday night against Miami FC. So, it's going to be a quick turnaround because not a whole lot of time between by the time we record this and the next game. So, Jose, let's get to it. All right, listeners. So, Inner Miami went on the road for the, what's the first of three road matches over a span of eight days. And they lost. 1-0, to zero, a familiar 1-0 to zero scoreline. This was the starting lineup in a 4-2-3-1 formation. You had Drake Callender in goal. The back four, DeAndre Edlin, Serhi Kristoff, Kamal Miller making his debut, and Franco Negri. First line of the midfield, Dixon Arroyo also making his first start and appearance for Inter Miami with Gene Mota by his side. That second line of the midfield from right to left, Corentin Jean, Rodolfo Pizarro as the 10, Nicolas Stefanelli out on the left, and up top making his second start of the season, Leonardo Campana. Inter Miami loses this game 1-0 off of a goal from Daniel Stairs. In the 72nd minute off a deflected shot in the penalty area, that was enough to sink into Miami to a record-tying defeat. And one that has put Phil Neville in an even hotter seat, at least when it comes with the fan base 
and a good portion of the local media. Now, whether it's put him on the hot seat with ownership, we can debate that, we can discuss that, and we will. But Jose, just touching on the game, the defeat here at PNC Stadium in Houston, what were your overall thoughts from this game? Well, you know, I think I think there are some positives within the game because yes, they 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 had quite a quite a few chances, so I think that's that's good. Um, I think you know it's yes, there's 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 a little bit of a, of bad luck involved, but I just hate to think that way and 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 feel like that's an excuse for the team not getting a result because um, when you're losing five in a row. You just need to find a way to come through. And so um, that's reality, and we have to mention that, that yes, they, they did create opportunities. But at the end of the day, if you're still uh, losing games, that's what matters. You, you know, you, you, you have to win games to make to the playoffs, and, and that's the goal, at least for now, for this team. And um, I thought the performance was better than in the last few weeks. And... Um, and yeah, I think you know at, at some point you know the goal might might come through for this team. I don't know when that, when that's going to happen, but I do believe that you know it, it was a step forward in terms of chance creation. So sounds like you have some positive thoughts on this one, and I would agree that I thought the performance levels were better from the team. Uh, the introduction of Kamal Miller and Dixon Arroyo, I think, helped, and I think the team looked as good as it's looked in the past few weeks since this losing streak began uh, and I think that there were some positive signs that bode well for the future I do think that I didn't come away from this game as feeling as concerned about Inter Miami's future as I have in other matches now a lot of it gets overshadowed by the fact that yes once again this is Inter Miami's record tying sixth straight defeat I'll say it again record tying sixth straight defeat so they've matched the franchise record for consecutive losses in a row. They did so twice back in 2021 under head coach Phil Neville. So familiar territory, unfortunately, for the South Florida side. And, of course, that's going to be the big sentiment coming from the weekend in terms of the outside perspective. I'm sure there's a lot of positives that Phil Neville will be uh, looking at and happy with when he goes over the game film and he, he, you know, talks to the team. And I'm sure that's what he'll build on. But from the outside, I mean, the pressure's ramping up, uh, again, from the fan base and from media just because the results are not there. Jose, was this a good performance? Would you call this a good performance? Inter Miami finished uh, on the road with 20 shots compared to Houston's 11. And Miami put five on target compared to Houston's three. They lost. And, of course, that definitely stings when they're mired in this funk, in this long, long, long winless run. But was it a good match? Um, I think it was an okay performance. You know, for it to be good, they needed to score. And and they didn't. So it, it was an okay performance. And and one more thing that should be said as well is that, you know, Inter Miami played well, but they were not very consistent when they when they reached their highest level. Um they were there for like ten to fifteen minutes. And so um I think that there were there were some positives again, but I think it's just an okay performance. At this point, again, you have to come through. You have to come through, you have to score a goal. Uh, something needs to happen, whether it's from the from the bench, a player coming in and making a difference, uh, the coach the coach changing uh, formation within the game, adjusting to the opponent, or just the starters, you know, taking the next step. Something needs to happen for for Inter Miami to to make it a good performance, and it didn't. So for me, it was just okay. Was it progress though? It was. If we look back at the last two games. I, and we we evaluate the last three games. I would say yes, it was progress. But if we look at the whole season, I think not so much because you know we've seen this level of play from Inter Miami. We've seen good twenty minutes. We've seen good twenty five minutes. But 
I think that's what we saw against Houston. You know, the difference is that, you know, before in the first two games of the season, they did score. And now they, they just couldn't score. So, I mean, can, can we uh, tell people that, yeah, they dropped five in a row, but the sixth one was a good performance. So, yeah, things are starting to turn right now. But next week, it's going to be a lot better. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I personally, I would need more than that. Jose, I do think this was progress, especially from what we had seen before the bye week. That game against FC Dallas was the worst we've seen from Inter Miami this season. Tactical mess, incohesive game plan. That was an awful performance. So just judging off of that, this was progress. This was step in in, a, in the right direction, in my opinion. A step in the right direction. Now... If Inter Miami plays like this going forward, I do think they give themselves a better chance to be more competitive in the upcoming games. Will that translate to a lot of wins? Not sure. Maybe not. But they'll give themselves a better opportunity to start picking up points and to end this terrible stretch, this awful run of form. Listen, Leonardo Campana and... You know, it's not on him, but he did have a clear-cut opportunity early on. A nice header of a cross from the left, and he hits it right at the goalkeeper. You know, you would expect him to do better on that opportunity seven times out of ten. I'm not saying he's going to score seven times out of ten, but you expect him to do better than just to head it right down the middle. Maybe it's rust, him finding his timing again. Maybe it's just bad luck. And maybe Inter Miami did have some bad luck in this game because they had a bunch of half chances and none of them fell fortuitously for them. You know, there's that one shot in the second half Gene Mota had where he, he kicks the ball uh, from outside the area on a one-timed effort and it stings off the left post. Maybe in a different game, that stings off the post and goes in instead of stinging the post and going out. That said, that said, 20 shots is good. Not a bad haul, especially on the road. Five shots on target isn't great. So, still not a whole lot of clear-cut chances, right? Clear quality chances. They had one, they had a couple, but not a whole lot of clear-cut chances. So, you know, Phil Noble talks about ruthlessness all the time. And how he wants the team to be more ruthless. But do they have ruthless finishers, by and large, in this team? Are there clinical finishers that you would expect... Que no te perdonen. That won't forgive you for a mistake or a look. Not really. There's no go there's no player of the level of Gonzalo Higuaín in terms of finishing in this group. Maybe Joseph Martinez in years past, but this is not the Joseph Martinez of years past. So that's one problem. Another problem is how creative is this team? You know, how many clear-cut chances are coming through the run of play, through, through balls in behind? Not really seeing that. So those are things that if you're in Inter Miami, you need to work on. But again, I do think from just the sheer perspective of where they were before the bye week to now, I think it's progress. I think there's a, a little bit of reason for optimism. But yes, the, the defeat, the losing streak overshadows it by and large. Jose, when it comes to the attack, I know you just mentioned a few things. But what do you think Phil Neville has to do? He benched Joseph Martinez in this one. We will talk about that. In a little bit, yeah. But what what else can he do? Is it is it? Do you think it's tactical? Do you think it's you know? And, and I thought it was interesting that he said post game, none of the forwards can come knock on my door now and say that we're not creating enough chances. That to me was a clear uh, anecdote of something he shared with Joseph Martinez. Now that's not inside information, just my uh, sensation, just my supposition from the outside. Because to use that example. To me, it shows, or yeah, shows insight into a conversation he's had with a striker on the team. Now, what striker? Oh, yeah. What striker would say that? It can't be Campana. Campana only played one game this season before this match against Houston. So it has to be Joseph. It has to be Joseph Martinez, in my opinion. In my opinion. But anyway, just overall well, it for makes the attack. Sense. Yeah, it makes sense if you if we go back as well to the. You know, the never forgotten quote of uh, you get paid to, to score goals. You know, he, I mean, Joseph, he, he could have an argument like and you get you get paid to, you know, make this team create chances for me inside the box. So, yeah, 
yeah, that makes sense. You know, that's that's something that I think it wasn't called for because, um, I mean, everybody wants to score. I mean, I, I don't think the team is just uh, missing opportunities opportunities because they want to. I, I, I would say, you know, at this point, it's about it's a little bit about confidence as well. Uh, I, I see the team playing with no confidence at all. No confidence at all. And, and, and I think Franco Negri touched on it a little bit because, um, you know, it, it seems like the team is waiting for the worst thing to happen again and again and again and nothing good happening for them. So, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's about the coaching staff, you know, just letting players just build the confidence of the players. And, and obviously when you have those type of, uh, uh, of answers from Phil, those quotes, then you know that might not be taken well with the with the group so it's a difficult situation i would say you know at some point at some point we're going to have to uh see the full potential of of leo campana and joseph martinez playing together for more than 90 minutes or 60 minutes i think that was the the plan coming in and uh, i don't know if you agree but I would say if Campana is not injured two days before the opener, they play together, right? I mean, right. would you agree with that? Of course. I, so you know why change things now? You know what? What is what, what? Why isn't isn't Phil thinking about having them both playing together? They they played well. I know it was preseason, but they played well. The minutes that they had together, they were not bad, not bad at all, and uh, that was the hope for goals this year. To be honest, if we go back to the final days of preseason, Campana and Joseph at the top was the hope for goals. Right. And all of a sudden, they can't play together. Right, because, well, I mean, I think that the team looked at Stefanelli as someone that was going to provide some goals this year. And I know you, you definitely don't agree with it, and I'm with you. But I think the team did look at Pizarro for bringing in goals. You know, Phil Novo recently made a comment as well that... Um, you know, he's a scorer. I, we actually asked Pizarro about that last week in terms of not Phil's comments, but about, you know, what Phil asks of him tactically. Um, because, like you had mentioned very notably in a couple of pods ago, that Pizarro's highest goal scoring season is seven tallies. So it's not like he's ever been a pure lethal goal scorer. Uh, let's put the ball in the back of the net a whole lot. So. Yes, they they needed these. They thought they these players were going to provide a lot of goals and Campana maybe he will the season's still we're only a fourth of the way through but they don't have a whole lot of proven goal scoring talent and then they don't have a 10 which also proves troublesome for this attack so there are some things there that need to be addressed or find a different way to make this work maybe it's putting Joseph and, and Leo, to, Leo Campana together again up top like we saw in preseason that we have not seen uh, much of this year besides the the FC Dallas game. But the attack clearly needs help. This was the fifth time they've been shut out this season. It's just not clicking. You talked about some interesting things there, Jose, including Phil's comments, which I want to get to, but you talked about confidence. And I agree with you, of course, when you're in a you're mired in a six game slide like this, pretty difficult to have confidence as a group. And as an individual. With confidence comes belief. With wins comes belief. Do you think this team believes and buys into what Phil Neville is selling? Do you see that? Do you do you, does that no. does that transmit it to you from the team? No, at this point, no. I just don't see it. I don't see it. And um and, and and you know I think it's it's pretty clear to me when you look at the performance for individually for the players. Um, I feel like you know Nico Stefanelli played probably his worst game with Inter Miami, and um, I, I think he's a lot better than that and he's not performing. I think Coco is better than that and he's not performing. Um, there are only a few players really. At this point, that you know are are, are doing a that are playing at their level, and maybe even Kristoff, 
you know, he can go a little bit higher. I think Drake Callender is playing at his level. Um, I think DeAndre Yeldon is underperforming. Um, we're not going to talk about Miller and, and Arroyo, you know, because it's just one game for them. We will talk so, about them, but just not in this, no, not no. In this context. I know what you mean. Yeah, not in this context, of course. Um, I think Negri is doing well as well, but offensively, defensively, I think he's still, you know, he, he has way, ways to go. Um, so if you look at that, I mean, the, the way the players are performing individually, they're just not doing enough. And um, I just, I, at this point, I think they are just as frustrated as the fans, if not even more, because they're on the field. They are the ones that, you know, get all the blame. So I agree there that I don't see a whole lot of belief from this team. Like, it doesn't, there's no, that's not what it's transmitted to me when I watch them either in person or on TV. I don't see a team that believes in itself. Like, I see a team trying, right? The effort, like Phil Neville said post game, the effort is there and has been there for much of the six games losing streak. But I just don't see conviction. I don't see that personality from the group. I just don't see it. Maybe other people see it. I don't see it. Now, we can dive into Phil Neville's comments because I think that does tie into it a little bit here. Look, Phil Neville has not shied away from pointing the finger at himself. However, for me, for me, I don't know if you agree, Jose. You can tell me right now. He does so when the question is asked of him. When someone yeah. in the media says, you know, whose responsibility is this? Or, or you know, why, you know, when, when like, it's obvious that people are asking to hear him say that, that's when he says it. He doesn't really come out and say it outright or up front by his own accord. And I think what was telling was that, that comment, that anecdote about no forward can come knock on my door now and say that we don't get enough chances. Because it, it felt like me like he's pushing the blame on the team instead of himself. And in this one, that's that, that might be fair. That might be fair. But when you're in a six-game losing streak, does that, does that comment help? Does that comment really help? It's like he's trying to say, it's not on me, it's on the players. I'm doing everything I can, it's on the players. That, that's how it came off to me. I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and, and again, I think that's uncalled for. I think that's, that's, that's not good. Just It doesn't help the team at all. You know, It helps him and his argument of, okay, I'm doing my job, but it's out of my hands to put the ball in the back of the net. And I think that's not what the team needs right now. It's, it's not what the team needs. I think at this point, you know, whether, you know, things are going, because remember when, when the, when the, when the season started, you know, it was all praise. I mean, everybody was fine. I mean, he was talking about the players and how good they were and the potential of this team. And now I feel like, you know, at some, uh, there are some instances in, in where, in which he tries to move away from that and, and just create an excuse and, and find a way to, okay, I take responsibility, but there's always a, but there's always something that there's somebody else that's not doing their job right or doing something wrong. I just, I, I don't know, man. I think it, it's it's a very di- difficult situation right now. It's a very difficult situation because you know at some point as well you have to start thinking about what what's what's the future of the team at this point. You know, with with the frustration that this can create uh, uh, for the players, for the fan base, it's a very tough situation. Uh, but and that's what I'm saying. That's why I think messages like that, even if they're small. The players are going to hear that. It's going to get to them one way or the other, either through agents, whether they go out and look for the comments themselves. It's going to get to them. One way or the other, stuff like that gets to them. They're immersed in this. This is their day-to-day. I think stuff like that doesn't help, and I think it's what leads back to the first point of this this conversation, this point they were just making here, is that there's a lack of belief. Because of things like that, because of comments like that, It's I, I think it's accurate that the team needed to do better with the chances it had in this game. But it's a six-game losing streak. The team, by and large, has not been performing. You touched on Nicola Stefanelli. I still don't think we've seen the best version of Nicola Stefanelli. And I don't know what needs to happen for us to see that. Yes, he shoulders some of the responsibility. Absolutely. And adjusting to a new league, all that. 
But I think some of it falls on Phil Neville too. Not finding his best position. You saw in this game, he started out on the left, then he played as the 10. Where Pisato started as the 10, and then he played out on the left. Clearly, Phil Neville's not figuring it out either. But again, he doesn't take on that responsibility publicly. I think he only takes on the responsibility of going out and saying it. Right, just to say it. Once you judge his tactics or you judge, you know, the way he uses players in terms of positions as well, then he would never agree with you on that. I mean, that's that's part of the responsibility. I mean, there's something really that's not right with the team right now if you're not getting results. So it's not only about saying, yes, I take responsibility. Uh, I mean, it's it's a 1-0 one, one, result and I take it. It's my responsibility. But how about tactics? How about uh, player development? How about... You know, giving consistency to the players in in, right. in a specific position. How about that? Is that responsi- Is that part of I take responsibility, or is it just about going in during the presser and, and saying, saying and saying the right I thing take. and saying yeah. the right thing, right? Which which is what I think Phil does, and Phil has worked in in the media before. So he's a savvy, he's astute, he knows what people want to hear, and that's why again, when he's asked the question, then he says it, but he doesn't come right out and say it. The game against FC Dallas two weeks ago, which you and I agreed, and not saying that we're 100% right here, but we thought it was a tactical mess. DeAndre Yellen at center back, you know, Robert Taylor as a right wing, but we thought it was just not not a good game plan, and that showed on the field. Phil Neville postgame didn't come out and say, you know, we got the game plan wrong, or I got, I got the tactics wrong. Like, he doesn't say that, and I think that trickles down. I think that that does have an impact. Rolfo Bizarro, last week when we spoke to him, Prior to this game against Houston Dynamo, he said, and Andrea touched on this in the pod last week, he doesn't feel like he has, he doesn't feel that much, he doesn't feel that confident. He doesn't feel as confident as he did maybe earlier in the season. Why? Why would a player not feel confident? The coach has a big part to do with that. The coach has an absolute big part to do with that. Yes, the player has to deliver, and, and that will help his, his performance levels and raise his overall confidence, but the coach has a big part to say, and if... Uh, a player is believing in himself because the coach believes in him. Does Rodolfo Pizarro, deep down inside, really feel valued and feel like an important part of this team, even though he's starting once in a while? I don't think so. There was talk about moving him in preseason, even you know, even Chris Henderson at one point, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, no, it was actually Phil Neville. Phil Neville said at one point, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle when he was talking about Pozuelo maybe staying, but you know, he touched about Pizarro's situation, like... Does Pizarro really feel valued? Or does he know that he's gone and he's out of here after this year no matter what? You know, like, and I think I think we are seeing that. I think we are seeing that. The Joseph Martinez thing is interesting and we will touch on that here in a bit. Let's touch on some of the new players or the two new players that came into the fold. We'll start with Dixon Arroyo, who played as the six next to Gene Mota. It's only one game, but your initial impressions on the type of player Arroyo is, and what he brought and might bring to this team. I think Arroyo is is a traditional um, six or five, if you want to say it in Spanish. You know, he's a traditional six. He, he'll, he'll recover the ball, but uh, I, and again, this is the first game, but with the ball, I don't know. I have my doubts. I mean, I, I trust him to recover the ball, but I would say, okay, get the ball and give it to your teammate as soon as possible. <laughs> don't take a dribble. Don't think for a pass, a long a long ball. Just give the ball right away to one of your teammates. And and I would say to Jean Mota, please, as soon as he gets the ball, get close to him. Find a way. <laughs> Find a way to the ball, Mota. <laughs> that would be your, your 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 assignment for every single week. No, but I, I mean, I, I think I think he'll help the team. He, he will help. He will help. But I I don't think he'll he'll take on the on on all the responsibilities like Gregory did early this season. I don't think it's I don't think they are the same player. I don't think they are the same player at all. So he should be you know he's he's, he's better better good option. I think that that helped the team. But um, he, he's no superstar. So are you saying Gregory is more polished on the ball than Dixon Arroyo? Yeah. Really? I would, I would say even Gregory is, is better with the ball than Dixon Arroyo. 
Interesting. Again, just one game. Just one no, game. No, right? interesting, I mean, though, because that was not my, my impression. I thought Arroyo with the ball was better than Gregory. That's what I no. thought. There was definitely one play where he gave the ball away very cheaply, like at the top of the 18, uh, and that led to an opportunity for the Dynamo. But I think, again, this is his first game with the group. You know, he's still understanding the... The, los automatismos, like the, the yeah. movements and, and things like that. So there's going to be some not being on the same page. But from what I saw, I liked what I saw. I don't think he's the type, the same type of enforcer, bruising enforcer, getting physical in the middle, like he kind of said, you know, in the, in the pregame press conference. I think he's more of a, you know, read the game, you know, take the tactical foul if I have to, and things like that. But I, I liked what I saw, and I think it'll get better with time. As he gets more games, as he gets more reps, as he understands the patterns and the and the way his teammates like to play, and he understands the tactics as much as he can understand the tactics. I think I think it was a good starting point for him, and I think it will improve, and I think that will help Inter Miami. I think he's cleaner w- with the ball. We'll see over a longer stretch, over a longer sample size, but I think he's cleaner with the ball than Gregory. Does that mean that he'll deliver the same type of performance levels as Gregory consistently and be like that type of influence? Because we've seen in the past Gregory shine as maybe Inter Miami's top player in some matches. Will we see that from Dixon Arroyo? I don't know. But I do think with the ball, he's maybe a little bit cleaner. We'll find out. Kamal Miller at center back. I like it. Your thoughts on him. By the way, before before you give me, I know you just said you like him. Before you, you give me your full thoughts. Side note, before we get to Kamal Miller, what do you think about Phil Neville pregame saying they're a major, major doubt, and then both being in the starting lineup? <laughs> One, did you buy that? Did you buy that at all? No, I think we both agree. I think it was, Andrea it thought was nonsense. Andrea, yeah, Andrea thought he he was he was not playing, and we were both were like, mm, no, that's that's typical Phil telling you no when it's yes. It's it's like it was to me. It was so obvious that Dixon Arroyo was starting. Come on, Miller, because we hadn't seen any footage of him practicing in any jersey, uh, training jersey on. I was more dubious about him, although I still thought there was a chance he would play. And they both start. Is I think that I think that comes with experience as well, Franco. You know, you know how to read coaches. You, you learn how to read coaches. You have to understand that not every single word that a coach will tell you in a press conference is is true. I mean, they find ways to hide stuff, and uh, I think that comes with experience. When you really pay attention to to the press conference, and you just don't go and you know sit there and wait for um, a coach or a player to tell you how to resolve uh, every single problem in your in your life then you know you you know you understand that you know they they have a job to do as well in terms of not letting information out there but at some point you already i mean you, you we learn how to how to players how to coaches react when they tell when they're telling you the truth and when they're just telling what they need to to, to tell you so i think that comes with experience i think we caught this one on on phil and uh, I think he needs to start doing a better job. <laughs> I mean, I, and that can go back to a bigger point of just you know him as a young head coach still cutting his teeth, still figuring it all out. Uh, that's very old school, though. That's very old school. I mean, you know, he, like, tried to, he tried to do the the, the 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 pump fake to use a basketball reference. It's the Miami Heat are playing playoff basketball right now. He tried to be like, all right, we're not, we're doing this. No, we're not. Just kidding. But like, I don't know, man. It just it just seemed so obvious to me. Seems so, and I tweeted it out. This is not a uh, hindsight is twenty twenty example. I tweeted it out before I fully thought Dixon Arroyo was playing. I mean, they even had they even had him in a press conference before the game, like, and he's been training for a week and a half before then. Like, who really believed that Dixon Arroyo was not was a major doubt that he was not going to play? Did anyone really believe that? Anybody? Did the Houston Dynamo? Did you think Ben Olsen was sitting there on his computer at home or on his? iPhone, I assume he has an iPhone, don't know if he has an iPhone, and was like, hmm, this new guy that they signed, they've been posting a lot of you know social media on about he's maybe not going to play. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Yeah, I don't see it. I don't see it. Yeah. Oh, but anyway, Kamal Miller. Yeah, Kamal Miller, I think, you know, I think he had a good performance. I, I liked him. I liked him. I, I, I really thought he was, he was an upgrade over McVeigh. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he did... Something that 
we we never saw from McVeigh, and I'm sure this was asked from him because obviously with Nagy moving forward for most of the time, you know, McVeigh needed to do a better job in managing his position and the room behind uh, Franco Negri. Uh, and I thought, uh, I, th I think initially that that's something that needs to be fixed, by the way. And I asked Phil this in the last game of preseason, and he basically said, no, it's fine. There's no problem there. I think that needs to be fixed. I, I mean, Negri needs to move forward, but he also needs to run back and be present defensively, not chasing. Um, but McVeigh was not doing a good job helping out. Covering for him, right. And, and I thought... Uh, Miller did that at, at, at some point here in this game. So I really like that. Obviously, a lot easier for him, right? Because he has been playing in the league for so long. And um, uh, I think I think he's, he's in a time in his career where, where you know, he's very close to, to, to reaching his highest level. And if not, this is his highest level. So I think, you know, it's going to take a shorter time for him to adjust. And But I, I like the, the, the first game, good performance, I would say. I agree. I thought, again, the two newcomers, I thought they were both solid to good. I thought Kamal Miller did a good job back there cleaning things up. Also, carrying the ball forward gave them a little bit more presence back there, if you will, you know, in terms of uh, his size, his strength, a um, bit more polished than Christopher McVeigh, that, like you said. So, I thought it was a solid debut. We haven't heard from him yet now. We will speak to him on Tuesday in the lead up to this game against uh, Miami FC in the Miami Classico in the U.S. Open Cup. Kamal Miller will be formally introduced in a press conference, so we'll get to hear his thoughts, which is interesting because normally we hear a new player's thoughts before the game as opposed to after, but uh, nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, solid, solid performance. I do think, touching on a different point there, that I do think Phil Neville pulled the reins a little bit in terms of Franco Negri, yes, he did get involved in the attack. Yes, he did get high up in the attack. But I didn't see him bombarding forward with as much reckless abandon uh, to the defensive assignments as he did in the past. Now, again, doesn't mean that he wasn't tasked with going forward. He absolutely was. And again, yet again, much more than DeAndre Edlin down the right. And I think if Franco Negri was a little bit uh, more confident... I think maybe he pulls the trigger on one of those looks because I thought he had a good look in the in the second half. Yeah, in the second half, both in the of second them. in the second yeah in the second half right. There's there's two really good plays where he gets forward. One he he tries to tee up uh, a teammate and and the play, chance goes to waste. But I, there was there was one where I thought he should have pulled the trigger, man. I thought he had the look, but he didn't and. Maybe that's, you know, one of the details, the small details, right? Because it comes down to little details at the end of the day. Some of the little details that can maybe be ironed out and and worked on to help improve the side to give themselves a better chance to, to win some games. So positive performances from Kamal Miller and Dixon Arroyo. I expect more from them uh, in terms of their performance level as time goes on, as they get more comfortable and get more familiar with their new teammates and tactics. All right, Joseph Martinez. Did not start for the first time this season for a game in which he was available. Remember, he missed the game earlier this year because he was on international duty, but this was the first time he did not start when he was on the match day roster. After the game, Phil Neville was asked about benching Joseph. Phil Neville said that Joseph Martinez understands that he's been in football a long time, that they had a conversation, that it's about, you know, Sitting him, so taking some of the pressure off of him. Again, all the all the right things, all the positive things to say. They're not positive, but just just you know, saying the right things. Jose, we had been saying for some time that Joseph deserved to be benched. I think it was the right decision. Like I said before, and for multiple weeks, I think it's it was time. It was overdue for him to be benched just based on his performance levels. So, no problem with him being benched. However, again, going back to that anecdote that we talked about earlier, don't know how well that's going to go over with Joseph Martinez and the relationship there. I also have questions about Joseph Martinez's physical level or where he's at physically right now. Because he has not looked 
to me, to me, in optimal conditions, physically. Not where he's needed to be. I think he might be working his way to being where he needs to be. But I think, and I've started to hear this lately, that he didn't come into preseason where he needed to be from a physical standpoint. In terms of conditioning, in terms of fitness, in terms of his overall um, just game shape, body shape, just wasn't where it needed to be. So, I think we saw that during the first few games. You know, his low performance levels, his his struggles to get involved. You know, the chances he did have, not sharp enough. Well, remember last year, they didn't finish very well for him. So, it's it's not about not only being in shape, but, you know, it's it's been a while since, since, since he has been a consistent starter. So, yeah, listen... I think but if, that, he, if he's physically not in the condition he needs to be in as a professional athlete, that's well, on him. That's on him. Now it's on Phil Neville for turning to somebody who wasn't why, in why optimal. Why did they hire him? Why did they so, sign him? So, that, so then that is where I was going with it. Not starting him in this game is the first sign to me. Because it, it's not that they sat him because he needed a rest. It's not because of anything like that. It's he got sat, he got benched because he's not producing. In Phil Neville's own words, post game said it said it differently, said it much more polished and nicely, and you know decorated it with flowers. But he he didn't start because he hasn't been producing, which is fair. I think that's fair based on what we've seen. But I think it's the first sign of Phil Neville admitting that his big off season gamble is not paying off, because by and large we. No, from what has been said, it was Phil Neville who wanted to bring Joseph Martinez to the organization. Phil Neville who pushed for it to happen. Now, we haven't seen or heard of any locker room chaos or any issues there with regards to Joseph Martinez. But if one of your top off-season acquisitions is a striker and you're benching him because he's not scoring, after you turn to him over and over and over and over again then that, to me, is a sign that they're starting to maybe realize that this gamble, at least up until now, is not paying off. And that's, that, would be, that would be a big miss for Inter-Miami. Because they... Here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with that. Expectations are around Joseph, and, I, and I've said this before. You did, you did get this. I, did, I will give you um, your... I don't want to say props. I will give you... Uh, I will commend you for, for seeing it early. Where I was like, oh, Joseph's going to come in here. He's going to score some, a lot of goals. Uh, and I think he's going to get back to that level. I thought he was at first like the, the preferred option over over uh, over Campana or that he would be. But clearly I was still stuck in the past, in the, yeah, in the think... previous version of what Joseph Martinez was and not in the realistic version of what Joseph Martinez is. It... What, what he could offer you as opposed to what he will offer you. If if everybody in the league expected twenty goals from Joseph this year, he, he I mean he he would he would have signed a, a DP contract at some place. I mean, expectations for Joseph, you know, shouldn't be very high. I mean, he shouldn't be the player that is going to take you to the to the playoffs or to win a championship. He's not that player anymore. He's not that player anymore. And if you thought that he was that player and you're inside Inter Miami, then it's on you because, you know, it's not on Joseph at this point, not even on Joseph. It's on you. You made the mistake to assume that Joseph Martinez was, at this point in his career, the player that dominated the league a few years ago. And that's not the case. That is just not the case. So, yeah, I will blame Joseph because, okay, it's six games, no goals, the team is not winning. But it's not all on him. It's not all on him. He, what, what could make the difference for, for Inter Miami at this point? One or two goals from Joseph Martinez? Okay, maybe you tie a game. Maybe you tie against, against Houston. That's still, you know one point in, in six matches. So 
is that the bigger difference? It is not. It is not. You know, the expectations should be a little bit more realistic when it comes to the Venezuelan. And I think that that's where either Phil Neville's gamble was misguided. And I listen again. I was, you know, I was there with them there in preseason, thinking that Joseph Martinez would come in and score a bunch of goals. Um, and it hasn't proven the case. There's still a lot of season left. Things could still turn around. We saw Iguain do it last year. You know, maybe they sign a ten this this summer, and uh, the whole thing turns around. But up until this point, the returns are not favorable, and it's looking, at least until now, that Phil Neville's offseason gamble is a miss. And if that proves to be the case over the long term of the campaign, then Inter Miami's not going to get very far. Because like you said, and like we've said on this podcast, they need goals. And where are the goals going to come from? That mean, a good, a good portion of them, I'm sure, when they did their their uh, their season uh, scouting or their season numbers, they were like, all right, well, we can get X amount from Campana, we can get X amount from Joseph, X amount from Stefanelli, and then a few here and there from, from the others. If Joseph's not pr- providing you anywhere close to what you expected, which, again, Inter Miami seems like they expected a good bit, then it's going to be a long year. It's going to be a long year. And Inter Miami's one game away from breaking the franchise record for consecutive losses in a row. So, very quickly, to close out this week, uh, this past weekend's game, Phil Neville, his demeanor, overall, post-game, what did you think? Not only from the comments, but just, like, everything overall. Because I saw, I'll start here, I saw a coach that looked pretty defeated. I, I told I told that to you and Andrea post-game. I saw a head coach que se veía derrotado. Defeated. Just, like, the body language, uh, his short response to your question. I just saw a coach that just is, is so frustrated and running out of answers quickly, you know, and and I've got my my question ready for him uh, for this week if they lose on Wednesday, because I don't think they can lose on Wednesday. We're gonna touch on that game here in just a bit, but I don't think they can lose on Wednesday. If they do, I have my question ready. It's already locked and loaded. Um, but yeah, I saw I just saw a coach that just didn't look again, no confidence, and of course you're in a six game losing streak. Why would you show confidence? But you've seen Phil Neville in other moments during the losing streak be defiant, be much more portraying a different image. Otro imagen. And I don't think we saw that here. He had his arms crossed, you know, clearly frustrated that even when they deliver a better performance, they still can't produce the victory. What did you see from Phil Neville postgame? Yeah, I think he was frustrated. I think he was frustrated. I think he looks like a person that is running out of options. Uh, I think he tried to move pieces around. Didn't work. Um, You know, against Houston, he went back to a formation that, you know, he was comfortable with when when Campana was injured. Didn't work. Um, I just think he's, at this point, you know, he just doesn't know what to do. He just doesn't know what to do. And he's he's caught in between where, you know, he wants to take the responsibility, but also points to his players. It's I just I just is he losing it? Is he losing it? Is he losing uh, control of the ship? Uh, It looks like it. You know, I I cannot say 100 percent, you know, that that, that's the case, but it looks like it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Inter Miami's in 14th place in the Eastern Conference. Two wins, zero draws, six losses. Six straight. I do think those first two games, especially the first one, was a bit of fool's gold. I think it, it while it was definitely a bright start for Inter Miami, I think it the results masked the deficiencies. Because I saw in the attack, I saw struggles. Um, not, not a whole lot from the run of play. Uh, the first game, they, they didn't play particularly well against Montreal. They just, you know... And they, then again, and to be clear, I mean, Montreal... is the worst know, team in, in the Eastern Conference. It's the worst team, yeah. So, you know, at, at the start of the season, I remember Friel talking about this is one of the top teams in, in the league <laughs> last year. And, and, and I told you guys, it's not the same team. It's not the same team. It's going to take some time. They have a new coach, new players, a lot of new stuff, and they are still... A bad team, although they're looking a lot better 
with Bryce Duke and Ari Lasseter, which is something that we didn't talk about. But, you know, at some point in the second half, and just a quick point here, I thought they missed Duke and Lasseter. I really, I really, I really thought, man, this, this, this would be the perfect time for Ari Lasseter to come in the game. And they were not there. Yeah, so we know he didn't, he wasn't rating Ari Lasseter at this point. So yeah, but he I mean, wouldn't have come in. Anyway, he for Ari Lasseter would have been options off the of the bench, and they were not there. Well, clearly, I mean, if you look at the bench in this one, there were not many attacking options at all, at all. You had Borgelin, you had Joseph Martinez, you had Robert Taylor, and that's it in terms of attacking players. After yeah, not that, a lot. After that, it was Harvey Neville, David Ruiz, Christopher McVeigh, Victor Rio, Ryan Saylor. CJ Dos Santos, the backup goalkeeper, replacing the injured Nick Marsman on the bench. Not a whole lot of firepower there to look for goals. So I think I think Phil, again, is running out of answers. I feel like he feels like the walls are closing in on him a bit. I do think that the ownership group still will give him a longer leash. You know, I know a lot of fans are very unhappy, and we can get to this point. The fans are unhappy. A lot of fans are asking for Phil Neville to go. You know, I think if it were... Anywhere else in the world, I think he'd be pretty close to or, or on the brink oh, of being let go. Already let go. I mean, come on. But because after it's Inter Miami, game. after be- the fifth game in any other in any other country, you know he he will be he'll be out. I mean, I have no doubt about it. Especially the way things have been going for this team. Right, like that, that tactical mess that was the lost FC Dallas probably would have signaled the end for him anywhere else. Yeah. yeah, I think after that game against Dallas, where they would have had a bye week, they would have had some time to, you know, either bring in an interim coach and and you know just try to change of pace. I think that that would have been uh, the situation for most teams outside of MLS. But this is MLS, and look, Inter Miami as bad as they are, they're only five points away from a playoff spot. So, you know, he's going to get a longer leash. But that leads us into Wednesday's game. The Miami Classico, the second ever Miami Classico against Miami FC, the crosstown foe. Maybe you can use the word rival. Last year, that game was a lot of fun because it had a lot of meaning to it. Win or go home. Every play matters a little bit more. There's no longer picture here of, oh, you can make the playoffs even if you lose this game. No, this is, you either win or you're out. So Inter Miami will travel to FIU Stadium on Wednesday evening to take on Miami FC. Miami FC, (laughs) as luck would have it for Inter Miami, just won their first game of the season in the USL. And their overall record this year is one win, four draws, Two losses, they've scored seven goals, they've given up seven goals. Their only win, again, to reiterate, came this past weekend. And they beat the Las Vegas Lights 4-1. to 4-1 to one at home. So Miami FC comes into it with confidence. They've gotten their first win. They're going to be believing that they can beat Inter-Miami. Last year, that group probably should have beaten Inter-Miami. If not for Drake Callender making some, some very good saves... Which was maybe, you know, his... Coming his, out party? Yeah, his coming out party. The the initial introduction of Drake Callender. I, I don't think it was his first start. Maybe it was. But uh, it was essentially the, what really got him going and into into the start to get into the spotlight. But anyway, uh, Miami FC, full of confidence. Inter Miami, reeling against the ropes. But Inter Miami's the better team. The more talented team. There's no way they lose this game, right? No chance, right? <laughs> There's no chance they lose this game, right? Jose, please, talk, like, talk, talk me off the ledge here. No. There's well, no way Inter Miami loses this game. No, listen, Miami FC is not the same team that they were last year. They are not that good. They don't have that that the talent that they had last year. That that's the first thing. Um, I've called Miami FC games this year, um, and. Um, you know, I obviously have a closer look at the team, and I will tell you this: they have problems scoring, but they have two things in their favor, which in cup games can help you win games. Two South Florida teams have trouble scoring. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's terrible. Bad for soccer fans here. Yeah, so two things for them. The first one, they play good D. They play good defense. Very good. And you just mentioned they only have allowed seven goals. And the second one, they are very good in set pieces. Very, very good. They have been unlucky not to score more on set pieces. So, you know, if you combine those things, and if Miami FC, if they have a good start, I think they need to have a good start. They cannot allow Inter-Miami to score early because they cannot come back. So if they have a good start, we go into the second half, set piece opportunity, that's how they can win the game. But if they don't have that scenario, scenario working for them and Inter-Miami scores early, I think it's going to be an easy win for Inter-Miami. Now, Miami FC's head coach is still Anthony Pulis, the former Inter-Miami assistant. And you, we could see last year uh, how frustrated he was that his team didn't prevail in a game in which it played fairly well against Inter-Miami, right? The, the inferior team against the... Uh, supposed superior team just based on where they are in terms of uh, the pyramid. Can I say one more thing? Yes. Um, what, what I just told you, it's thinking about Inter-Miami playing the starters. So that's what I was going to get to. That's yeah, what I was going to get to. Rotates the squad and they don't play starters, then, you know, it's a different ball game. So- it's a different ball so Phil Neville alluded to the starters playing post-game when he, he spoke on this past Saturday. Uh, now, I had heard I had heard that the initial plan was for Inter-Miami to rotate and play some of the younger players. I don't know if Inter-Miami has the luxury to do that, given the current situation. And yes, they do play again on the weekend in a game against... The Columbus Crew, Eastern Conference opponent, in regular season action. But I don't think you can afford to play young players given the situation that the team is in. Because if you drop this game publicly, I don't think there's any going I don't think there's there's any going back. There's no going back publicly. Again, I don't think even if they lose this game on Wednesday, which would be a massive blow and a huge embarrassment. I still don't see Inter Miami firing Phil Noble. As deserved as it might be. But I think publicly, I don't think there's any going back. From the fans, I just don't see it. So they can't lose this game. I tweeted that in the aftermath on Saturday. They cannot lose this game no matter what. No excuses, think- nothing. Whatever it takes, even if it's a shot from distance that nicks off the butt of Leonardo Campana and finds the back of the net, if that's what it has to be, you have to win this game. Losing this game, it, it, it would be just the cherry on top to this rotten, putrid banana split. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it'd be massive. I think... I think, you know, you, you talk about just can't afford to, you know, play the the young players and the role players. I think more, other, other thing more than Inter-Miami um, not affording to do that, I think more is like Phil Neville, he just cannot afford to do that. And I think the, the starting lineup on Wednesday will be very telling of how much pressure is Phil really under. Mm-hmm. If he starts... If he plays eight, ten starters, then I think he really is under a lot of pressure. If he feels comfortable with, you know, just giving opportunity to players. Because then again, think think about it. I mean, if you're under pressure, why would you start, you know, young players thinking right. about Saturday when you might not even Well, I, I think the young players thing is out the window now. I think you yeah. might see a rotation. I think you might see, you know, some of the the more seasoned players that aren't getting starts come into the lineup, like a Robert Taylor. Uh, you know, I expect Dixon Arroyo to be back in there, as well as Kamal Miller. Uh, maybe you see Christopher McVeigh back in there. Possibly Harvey Neville. And and there's and also there's you know the 
conversation of the of the turf, mm-hmm. which you know over there. I mean, we, we have been calling it uh, new, but it's been a while now. It's been a while. The one that they had before was absolutely, you know, just unplayable. But it's still turf. So um, Joseph playing in turf. That's something that, you know, they need to think about or he might think about. Joseph and Campana, given Campana's yeah, Campana, injuries. Well, so is it a game where Borgelin starts now? Uh, I don't know. If I'm if I'm feel I play, <laughs> I play my starters. <laughs> I take my chances. I take my chances. I play my starters because you just have to win that game. You just have so, to win that so, game. So I think... <laughs> And Think for is, the brand. But for no, no, brand. but no, but Jose, let's 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 talk let's talk about this, and we can go in detail. I know we're going long, but let's let's just talk about this because Inter Miami said they want to win the Open Cup and they want to blah blah blah. You know, it's it's wow. a, it's an easier pathway to the Champions League, etc., etc., etc. But the bigger picture here for Inter Miami is the regular season. I think for the outside and for the image. They can't lose this game. Because, again, from the outside, there will be a whole lot of noise if they lose this game. But ultimately, I think Inter Miami cares more about the regular season than the Open Cup. And I think they're, I don't think that they would risk Joseph Martinez and maybe even Campana to an extent on that turf if they know that the longer-term picture is where they finish in the regular season. Yeah, but here, the, the problem is, right now... Is the the man in charge of, you know, taking this team to the playoffs? He doesn't know if he's going to be here by Saturday. So, are you really thinking about the playoffs? When so you really think Inter Miami would fire Phil Neville midweek before another game against an Eastern Conference opponent if they lose on Wednesday? Yeah, I think I'd be, I mean I think that would be fireable. I'm not saying I'm not saying you think it would be fireable. I don't disagree with you that it should be fireable if they lose on Wednesday. But do you realistically see Jorge Mas, Jose Mas, David Beckham on a in person meeting, or I don't know where David Beckham is these days, but if he's gonna conference in on Zoom and be like, Phil, it's time for you to pack your bags and go. We're we're letting Jason Christ take over for the weekend. Like I just yeah. don't see that happening, Jose. I, I can see it. I, I don't I see honestly, it. I don't see it, man. I don't see Inter Miami. We can see it. And I've been telling you in in our WhatsApp group. I've been telling you, you know, and I've said this before. You know, Jason is ready to take on that role. I mean, Jason. You know, if he ta- he can be an interim coach for a month, let's say. And he'll take over, and things will continue on Saturday. They'll go to Columbus and try to regroup. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you're Jorge Mas, Jose Mas, I think you're giving Phil a, a, a bigger chance as you can. And you just cannot afford for your brand. And then again, like I said last week here, the Mas brothers, they are not soccer people. They want to win. It doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter what league they're playing on. They just want to win. They want to be relevant. And you just cannot afford to to you, you can just cannot afford Miami FC to take center stage. And then again, remember this game now it's available on on CBS locally. Mm-hmm. Um, CBS Sports Golazo for CBS streaming. Sports. I mean the, the the game is getting some traction so you know, it it would be really, really negative for the brand if Inter Miami cannot come. I to don't, it. I don't disagree with that. I just don't see them firing him midweek when there's another game for a competition that matters more to Inter Miami on the horizon. I think if he loses he Wednesday, play. I think if he loses Wednesday and then loses Saturday, then I could see him coming back home on Sunday and then that meeting taking place. I, I think there's a lot more chances of that than him getting fired midweek this week, because I think Which, then. Then you've got some time to go into uh, preparation for the next game, you know, with understanding and accepting it and processing it as a as a group, as a club, a little bit more. If you fire him on Thursday, there's no way that team is going into Saturday's game focused at all. There's no, and the preparation would be minimal. Well, so, if you don't, you're still gonna. If you don't, and and you drop the game against Miami FC. You know, not a lot is going to change between Thursday and Friday for them to be 
oh, in great condition to play against Columbus. Forget about it. There are some interesting names out there, though. You know, like uh, Tata Martino, who recently yeah. said in an interview that uh, returning to MLS is, is always a possibility. Lobby. That's lobby. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I just don't see it midweek. I know fans are, are clamoring for that to happen. Some fans are because they just, they're just tired of seeing, you know, Inter Miami at this level. Well, Tata coming back to MLS where he was successful. Um, well, at, before Messi signs with Barcelona, then you can create that relationship as well. Both Argentines. Then Rodolfo, there's Rodolfo Pizarro. Tata called him several times and got plenty of criticism for ca calling him up to the Mexican national team. And, of course, Joseph Martinez. So don't you think stars align? I mean, so, so now this is not... this. Is, so for the listeners, it's not something that's been reported and we're not reporting it. It's just we're just... You know, uh, saying he's a he's a guy that's out there. He's a guy that's out there uh, that has no job. If Inter Miami did want to hire someone, if they were contemplating firing Phil Neville, I mean, maybe Tata Martino wouldn't be a bad option. But nonetheless, and what a coincidence that he gives out that interview when jobs are opening. <laughs> what a coincidence. Uh, hmm. I'm suspicious now. Uh, well, look again, just to reiterate, I don't see Phil Neville getting fired even if they lose on Wednesday. Probably would deserve to be let go at that point, but I just don't see it happening. Jose, very quickly, very quickly, key to the game for Inter Miami. Against Miami FC, I think they need to score early. They have to score early. If they don't score early, you know, pressure comes to you and it's a cup game. Uh, yeah, you, you start thinking about previous games and and what it what it means for them to, to drop the game against Miami FC. Uh, and listen, Miami FC, they they got nothing to lose. Absolutely nothing to lose in this game. So, yeah, I think they have to score early. If they can score two goals, even better. Just trying to keep away Miami FC from tying the game late in the second half with a set piece. So, yeah, they have to score. They have to score at least two goals in the first half. The key to the game is playing as close to a strong lineup as possible. That, for me. If Inter Miami does that, then I think the talent gap is wide enough that they will prove that on the field, that you will see that difference over the course of the 90 minutes if they play as close to a strong starting 11 as possible. Give me at least seven of the regular starters. Seven. Seven. You say six, maybe that's passable, maybe, but I think it's a little bit more of a gamble. Um, but seven or more, seven or more, I think, Inter Miami has enough to, to make Miami FC pay and, and to win this game and to... Get some positivity back in and around the group. Some. I don't think it does a whole lot if they win. I think it helps. But I don't think it does a whole lot, given that they are playing inferior opposition and that they have another MLS game you know, shortly thereafter to prepare for and, and think about. So, uh, By the way, by the way, uh, if you're a basketball fan, spoiler alert, turn off the show or fast forward it a minute. The Miami Heat just won. Jimmy Butler, 56 points. 56 points, and the Miami Heat beat uh, the Milwaukee Bucks, and they're now they're up 3-1 to one in that series. Impressive. So, you know, there's there's an upset in the making right there. So hopefully for Inter Miami's sake, you don't see another one happen on Wednesday. But, all right, Jose, let's leave it there. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back for a short Q&A. Our final thoughts, we'll do that after this. <laughs> time we've got some pretty good questions this week some pretty good questions we can't get to them all sadly so maybe i'll hold some of these for the pod later in the week if we don't get to it fret not we maybe we can get to it later in the week on the second show that we do all right first one don cafecito if franco became coach of this inter squad how would the team be managed what tactics and formation would you employ which players would start? Same question goes to Jose Armando and Andrea Yanez. So Andreita is not here. Jose is. Jose, do you want to start with this one? Or do you want yeah. me to start? Yeah? I've All right. All right. For months now. I've been saying it for months. <laughs> Let's go. Well, now, now personnel has changed, but the formation will remain the same. Um, obviously, um, calendar on goal. 
um, Yedlin, Christoph, Miller, and Negri. Then I'll play um, Mota and Arroyo. I'll play Pizarro on the right, Stefanelli on the left, Campana, and Joseph at the top. So you can call it a 4-4-2. Four, four, I would call it a 4-2-2-2 two, 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 just to give you you know, a better idea of what my shape would look like. Now, I mean, there's a lot more than just the, the players that would start, right? Like, I'll, I'll go into, like, the, you know, how would the team be managed in terms of tactics and formation. Because I do think, and, I mean, if you've listened to this pod over an, any extended period of time over the last few seasons, you can probably decipher what my football philosophy is. I like a possession-based team. So I don't dislike how Inter-Miami went about things earlier this season. Now, I do think, and again, this goes back to the point, if you've heard the pod, you can hear some of my criticisms of Phil Neville, I do think he tinkers with the formation way too much. Doesn't leave for consistency and familiarity for the players. And that he plays players out of position as a result of that. So for me, you would see a 4-2-3-1, or a 4 3 3. I'm not saying you never ever use any other shape. You know, it depends on the game. You need to close the game out. The other team's attacking. Maybe you go to a back five in the last five, ten minutes. But I would look to be the protagonist with the ball while also keeping things simple. Two formations, tops, that, you, that would be turned to on a consistent basis. Let the players find that familiarity in their spots and go from there. Now, of course. It's, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, you would like uh, an organized team, and it's easy to say you'd like a possession-based team that has verticality and speed. I mean, it's easy to say that. So I, I won't go into, you know, what my dream scenario would be. But I think that's some of the changes I would make. S- simplify things tactically and formationally. And I like technical players. Now, MLS is a physical league, so you have to have some physicality in there. So with this group, it's hard to find that that combination of players where you find the right balance. I think that's something Phil Neville has struggled with. But that's that's what you would see, or that's what my idea would be behind the team. Technical, possession-oriented, and two systems tops to breed familiarity and chemistry and understanding. That would be me. Jose... Do you want to add to that, or are you just going to leave it with your 11 starters? No, I would just leave it with my starters because, you know, I think... But what, what does that 4-2-2-2 two, two, two look like? What is it, like, you know? Are you, like, is, I, I like the tradition, I like to be as traditional as possible in terms of the role. I don't think there's a reinventing of the wheel when it comes to football. Like, I think it's just, you want wingers that can either take players on one-on-one and can either score or whip in service themselves. I think you need a 10 who can create. Well, you used to need a 10. Not necessarily anymore. But I, I'm you know? saying my system. My system. The wings. My system. My system. Yeah, but the game the game is played through the wings. And especially in MLS, an up and down type of league, I think you need to have some, some sort of presence through the wings. So there and you then go. again. So there you go. So, you, so that's where you would do it differently. That's where Jose's team would play more out wide. Stefanelli and, and Pizarro are not necessarily wingers, but you know I think if you give them the liberty to move around, um, then you know they they might get creative. I think that's that's I, I think that's the best that 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 position with the with, through the the middle of the field. Give them give him Pizarro liberty on the right and give him Stefanelli liberty on the left. I think that will open up a lot of room for for the strikers as well. Um, we know that um, you know Mota can move forward a little bit as well. He can help in the build-up. So alongside Dixon, I think they'll be good enough and they'll be stable enough that you know uh, Stefanelli and Pizarro can be comfortable with the ball, knowing that they have somebody behind. If they made a mistake, it's not going to be a big deal. And then you know I really like what I saw from Campana and Joseph together. I think they combine really well. So I would just think about giving them an opportunity, and I would be a little bit more cautious with, you know, the the um, the right back with Yedlin and and Negri. I think that yes, they can, you know, move forward, but not as aggressively as as they have been doing. Especially Negri. I think Negri. I think it's doing a little bit too much offensively, 
I think at that point, I would rather have Stefanelli with the ball. You know, just like the chances we were, we were talking about, you know, the chances that um, Negri had, if Stefanelli had the ball, Stefanelli would think, I'm taking the shot. This is my goal. I'm scoring here. And then because the left back is moving forward, then Negri is thinking, wait, wait, what do I do now? Where's, where's my goal scorer? Where's, where's my striker? Where's my midfielder? He, he, he deferred as opposed to taking matters into his own yeah. hands or rather feet. He's a left back because he's a left back. So... Uh, I don't know. I, I think that's the that's the best way to go because because of the personnel you have. Would that be my ideal formation? <laughs> no. Well, I'm going with my ideal. I'm going with the ideal. I, I'm saying I, I, I want to be realistic here about you know what what's available for me. <laughs> well, if, if that's the question, without then... Bryce Duke, without Bryce Duke, I listen, mean... uh, Bryce Duke wasn't like this savior either. But so like that's let's let's not make him out to oh, but be if like. You're looking, uh, if you're looking for a system with a ten, then you need Bryce Duke. And I now, don't know about that. I don't know. I would have. I again. I was never too overly convinced by Bryce Duke, even as a ten. Well, Montreal. You know, Montreal. They they have been winning. Two, they won two out of three games that Bryce Duke started. They have been creating more chances. They have more possession. You know, things are looking a lot better with Bryce Duke on that team. I would leave it four, two, three, one. And with, if you're talking about the personnel that they have now, I mean, the back four is pretty straightforward. At this point, Craig Calendar and goal. Mota and Dixon Arroyo. Um, I think Robert Taylor, I would start him on the wing. I think you need that one-on-one skill. Even though he hasn't necessarily looked great when he has played, I, I think uh, you need some of that one-on-one on the wing. You need some players that can unlock a defense. And I don't think Inter Miami has enough of that right now. So I need some creativity on the team. Even if that means sacrificing some defense, so what? The name of the game is to score. I'm not saying I'm trying to win games 4-3, but you need some creativity out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'd sacrifice some of the defensive work for a little bit more uh, attacking edge. But, all right, next question, and we'll join two here. Comes from Endo and Doe Snows. So we'll start with Endo because he only has one tweet. And he says, Is it too early to start booing this fraud, all caps, of a manager <laughs> slash team? Or should we wait until we lose to our little brothers, Miami FC? Doe Snow says, Listening to the last pod, I agree with the couple that this was an awful trade. We keep giving up quality players that aren't producing because of our poor tactical outlook. Phil doesn't develop anyone. Duke and Lasseter will shine in Montreal. This is the second tweet from Dos Knows. All the players who have left have performed a lot better with their current teams. Luis Morgan, Julian Carranza, uh, Andres Reyes, and even Damian Lowe is looking good. The midfielder who plays for Minnesota. I guess he's referencing Will Trapp. Doesn't matter who comes in, Phil destroys their career. Thoughts. So, clearly a lot of venom aimed at Phil Neville's direction. Understandably so. Understandably so. Um, Jose, what do you want to touch on? Anything at all? I think it's fine if the team wants to start, I mean, the fans want to start booing the team and, and Phil. I think it's perfectly acceptable when you're mired in a six game losing streak and on the verge of potentially breaking that this weekend. Because I, midweek, that's a separate competition. If they win that, yes, they break the losing streak in all comps, but not in MLS play. They lose this weekend, they've set the new franchise record for losses in league play. So. Uh, I absolutely think booing at this point is perfectly understandable. I would say booing, losing one game is perfectly understandable. If you're unhappy, you're unhappy. Like that's you're allowed to boo. You're allowed to. Boo. Uh, I don't know. I get it at this point, but I'm not usually, you know, for booing your own team. I don't know. So uh, but you, I, but so I, you just I, have I to you just have to cheer like nonstop. No, you just don't. Just don't go. Oh, just you, so you go. just st- you just stand there quietly and, and don't make any noise? Yeah, yeah. So you can I, only I just, express. So you're taking the Miami, inner Miami approach to things. You can only express happiness and good thoughts. You can never focus on the bad things or the negative things. It's just it's positive. Just be positive. No, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say, is that you know, when it's this bad, then I guess there's no other thing to do. But um, I'm usually, you know, the type of guy, I'm very patient. So, 
I mean, I, I, would like wait until the, I, I, I would wait until the third game, I would say. But now we're, <laughs> we're we doubled my my, Your my threshold. Thr- <laughs> yeah. So now <laughs> we're in the sixth game. So yeah, I guess now it's okay. But um, yeah, I, I, well, you know, listen, things are going really, really bad, really, really bad. So. You're on the. Guess, you'd be on the verge at this point of of lighting uh, pitchforks and sharpening your. <laughs> or wait, no, <laughs> lighting torches and and sharpening your pitchforks. That's that's the, what I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a good point what Dosno says about players leaving and performing better. I do think there is something interesting there. Right, like even even Leandro Gonzalez Pires, he goes to un grande. A, Big team in Argentina and River Plate, and he's performing pretty well by uh, by all accounts. Yeah, starting games, scoring a goal here and there. It's 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 interesting that players have left. Several players have left and gone on to find success. But and then maybe- again, we should say this as well. We sh- we should say that you know most of the players, I think, with the exception of maybe Andres Reyes. And, and LGP, like Lewis Morgan left, and he went to the Red, to the New York Red Bulls, and he played his position. But so then that speaks to yeah. But but I mean, it, it, but that speaks to what it, those knows to say. Those saying doesn't matter who comes in. Phil destroys their career. I don't. I mean, I think I think I think that's I think that's a bit uh, of an exaggeration. Destroys their career. I don't know. Does he maybe stagnate the career? Sure. Yes. But destroy, I think, I think destroy is an exaggeration or, or a bit uh, a bit much. Look, he was very close to doing it last year with McVeigh, playing him as a left back. And I don't know if he did. You know, if, if that year for McVeigh playing as a left back took something out of, it, out of him in, in his natural position, because clearly this year playing as a center back, he was not playing well. So... You know, there's something to playing players out of position. I mean, that cannot help them. That cannot help them. It, you know, mentally, physically, you have to be frustrated. All the time. Yeah, you have to be frustrated as a player. I mean, if you're a striker, you want to score goals, right? I, I mean, you don't want to be put in a position where you're like you're a player that likes likes to play inside the box, and now you're playing through the wings, and you have to run two times or three times more than what you're used to or then what you want to run. So, I mean, for some of the players, I would say Lewis Morgan, that's the case without a doubt. And, and recently, I think Duke and Lasseter, that's, that those are, are the two players that if they excel playing for Montreal is because they're playing in their natural positions or at least where they like to play, which is something that they didn't do at least this year for Inter Miami. Lasseter played some on the wing. But anyway, all right. Uh... Let's leave it there. Let's leave it there because we're going long. All right. Final thoughts. Jose. All right. My final thought would be, um, you know, the importance of the Open Cup. You know, we, we talked about, um, okay, the Open Cup, it's it's not a priority, according to you, to for Inter Miami. They want, they want to make the playoffs. But we really have to put a lot of value into the Miami Classico or – any other matchup in Open Cup at, at this round, of course, because when an MLS team is involved, there's no doubt about it that, you know, everybody's watching that game in South Florida. So I always thought, and since last year, I was cheering for this game to happen. And I, I didn't care about the result. And obviously, I don't care about the result this year. But it's just about what the cup brings to a market like South Florida, where we didn't have professional soccer for too long. So try to cherish the moment and what the cup brings to the soccer landscape. There's just no comparison. You know, just having the opportunity, a lower league team playing against an MLS team, that excitement is something that was not here and it is now. So regardless of the result and the frustration, make no have no doubt that, you know, having these type of matchups is good for the market, it's good for South Florida, and it's good for the growth of the game. All right. My final thought is on some positives. We'll end the show on a positive note. And that's because both Noah Allen and Ian Frey are back in full training with Inter Miami after their 
respective knee injuries. Ian Frey, you really could see him in an image last week, back on the field. I think it was behind. He was behind Gene Mota in one picture, so he's back in training after a year plus uh, of being sidelined. Noah Allen, a couple months out, but he played this past weekend for Inter Miami CF2. Started for them. So, two young players, two of Inter Miami's promising prospects who were dealt a blow in terms of health. They're back in the mix. I was going to say Frey, but then, you know, no pun intended. Um, But they're back in the mix. And I don't know if they'll be competing for first team minutes anytime soon, but they give Inter Miami. A couple more options. A struggling into Miami. A couple more options for the short term. So that's a positive development as far as the South Florida side goes. Okay, Jose, that does it for this first show of the week. We'll be back again. Hopefully, pretty sure, later in the week. Most likely with Andrea to recap the Miami Classical and preview the weekend that is to come against the Columbus crew. We'll see if there's... A brief respite from this losing streak or if the woes will only continue. So, for Jose Armando, I am Franco Penizo. You have been listening to Miami Total Football Radio. We'll talk to you guys again 